Welcome to this Saturday Travel and History Tip. We are knocking out the parks in Massachusetts. We have only a few more to go. We first took you to the Saugus Ironworks, then to the Springfield Armory, and a trilogy visit to the Longfellow National Historic Site, Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site, and the Adams National Park, then up to Salem, the Maritime National Historic Site. Last week, we went to the Minuteman National Historical Park and a famous cemetery. This week, we will be going to the new Bedford Whaling National Historical Park and a little side trip over to Plymouth Rock. Predominantly Portuguese, New Bedford is remembered as a capital of the whaling industry. Back in the days when spermaceti, candles, and whale oil lamps were necessities, not antiques. The city's harbor at the mile-wide mouth of the Acushnet River was home port for the East Coast's largest commercial fishing fleet until the industry collapsed in 1995. The New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park protects a rich history in the images of Herman Melville's bustling New Bedford, which lies along the Acushnet River. In 1841, the restless 21-year-old Melville, like many young men at the busy wharfs, launched himself onto the seas aboard the 350 59-ton square-rigged whaleship Akushnet. Ten years later, while living in Pittsfield, Melville wrote the classic novel Moby Dick, based on his adventure of a lifetime. Around 10,000 people found employment in the $12 million industry in the 19th century at the whaling capital of the world. Rendered from blubber, whale oil was used to light towns around the world and to lubricate machinery. Starting in the colonial era, Americans pursued whales primarily for blubber to fuel land. Whale blubber was rendered into oil at high temperatures aboard ship, a process called trying out. Whale oil from New Bedford ships lit much of the world from the 1830s until petroleum alternatives like kerosene and gas replaced it in the 1860s. Spermaceti is a waxy substance that is found in the head cavities of the sperm whale and in smaller quantities in the oils of other whales. Spermaceti is created in the spermaceti organ inside the whale's head. This organ may contain as much as 1,900 liters. That's 500 U.S. gallons. That's incredible, isn't it? New Bedford was also a hub for hundreds of fugitive slaves utilizing the Underground Railroad as the whaling industry welcomed the hardworking people of color. Many arrived on sailing ships and climbed aboard whale ships on voyages in order to escape capture because of the Fugitive Slave Act. The act permitted slaveholders to recapture and return slaves. The city was also a stronghold for abolitionist-minded Quakers who were strong in the politics of their religion. Noted abolitionists orator and author Frederick Douglass fled to New Bedford in 1838 as a fugitive and stayed there for three years. Douglas, along with many other noted abolitionists, spoke at the former Liberty Hall. The National Park Service provides a park map of the hot spots of the Underground Railroad. You will find the park on the beautiful cobblestone streets of downtown New Bedford. The Visitor Center is the former New Bedford Institution for Savings and is the place to start your visit. A total of 329 whale ships based there by 1857 Comprising a 34-acre National Historic Landmark District, the park encompasses 13 blocks, including the Davis Observation Deck to view the port area and working waterfront, and the Whaling Museum. The 1836 United States Customs House, the oldest continuously operating customs house in the United States, is a central repository for all maritime records for the new Bedford Port. The main place that we visited on our tour of this National Historical Park was the Whaling Museum, where we saw the Kushnitz crew list signed by Melville, and a life-size model of a northern right whale named Limpet hangs on the upper level of the New Bedford Whaling Museum. The scary-looking 66-foot skeleton of a rare blue whale hangs imposingly in the museum that houses the world's largest collection of whaling artifacts and great interactive exhibits. This is one of the most interesting urban parks in New England. We climbed aboard the Lagoda, the 89-foot half-scale model of the square-rigged whaling bark is the world's largest whale ship model. Next, we rested on a bunk in the whale ship Foxhole. There were all kinds of displays, including this one. 
full of harpoons. Next stop, Plymouth. According to the famous traveler Jamie Jensen, he said, What witches and the witch trials are to Salem at the north end of Massachusetts Bay, the pilgrims and their tribulations are to Plymouth. Not a commonly known fact, the first references to Plymouth Rock were not made until more than 100 years after the landing. In 1880, the Pilgrim Society moved the top portion of the large granite rock from its location at Pilgrim Hall. Then, the date 1620 was etched into it. After many moves around Plymouth, souvenir hunters chipping away and a part of the rock being held at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., roughly one-third of the original rock remains. It lies under a protective columnar canopy that was constructed in 1920, replacing the previous more ornate structure. The rock, a vestment of Americana, symbolizes the landing of William Bradford and the rest of the pilgrims. It is part of the Pilgrim Memorial State Park, and it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The rock is just right there on the waterfront. Not a state park. A replica of the Mayflower boat, Mayflower 2, is anchored in Plymouth Harbor in eyesight of the rock. The Mayflower was a three-mast carrack. Pilgrim Hall Museum is a grand place to learn about the founders of Plymouth Colony. On the side lawn of the museum's yard, read a replica of the Mayflower Compact, which you may have learned about back when you were in elementary school. It's an incredible document that these Christians who ventured the Atlantic wrote when they landed in Massachusetts. Artifacts from the pilgrims on display there include kettles, baby baskets, arms and armor, Indian pottery, mirrors, furniture, and belt buckles. Interestingly enough, they were actually set on Virginia, but because of the storm, they were blown off course and ended up there in Massachusetts. And when they landed, the native Wampanoag people had already been there for thousands of years. Inside, there are some beautiful paintings depicting the pilgrims. The display that we appreciated the most were the pilgrims' Bibles. The Geneva Bible was one of the most popular Bibles. In this case, it is both a Geneva Bible and a King James Bible. American history. Learn it. Love it. Appreciate it. Don't let them steal our history. Share our American history. Please go see my website, danasbooks.net. We have featured videos and our latest videos and recaps of the travel and history tips that are presented each Saturday. A new section is the recipe section where we have beverages, smoothies, meals, side dishes, desserts, and fun foods. It's all on danasbooks.net. Hope you watch the Saturday travel and history tips. And if you appreciate our content, tell others and repost on your social platform. Next week, we will be going to Lowell, Massachusetts. Thank you.